Aaron now. The Briar Tankard is here already, but the real guests of honor tonight are Team Gushu. We're live at Valley Haley for a tribute to the Briar and world champions of curling. It's total devastation for us. Millions of dollars worth of materials burn as a hardware store is destroyed in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Tensions rise. The students' union says Munn is looking at tuition and fee increases. Munn says that's inflammatory. It's part of our mandate to actually bring dance to as many people as possible. Ballet Yorjin hits the stage and library. Wintry precip on the way. A little bit of snow and then freezing rain. Possibly significant for Thursday night in through Friday in the east. Not a bad spring looking forecast the west into Labrador. The details are coming up. Well, there's a war of words tonight between Munn, the Students' Union, and the province. The union says Munn is looking at fee and tuition increases to deal with a cut to its budget. Here now's Peter Cowan takes a look at that. The province has made it clear to Memorial University that it better not raise tuition fees for Newfoundland and Labrador students. So instead, what the university is looking at is raising other fees. It's talking about a facilities fee to help pay for the buildings here and a student services fee. Let's take a look at just how much that's going to cost. Right now, tuition fees at Memorial University for an undergraduate student are about $2,500 a year. Add in the extra fees that are being proposed and that cost goes up to more than $3,000. And for students who are from out of province, well, they're talking about an extra 16%. Overall, the Memorial University Students' Union says the end result is students could very well end up paying a lot more. It may not be under the title of tuition, but students are still being forced to pay extra money um, on top of what's already being paid out. So additional fees means new costs for students. So overall, it may, not, it may have a different title, but students ultimately are going to be paying more money, which is something that we don't like to see. Right now, tuition fees at Memorial University are the lowest in the country. So how competitive would it be here if these increases go ahead? Well, it would still be the second cheapest. Only Quebec would have lower tuition and only for students from that province. The minister responsible says he wants the university to look at other ways before it starts raising fees, things like cutting costs. I think we should get that off the table, that the university is starved of resources and has no other option except to increase fees because I think there may be an alternative, which is lower expenses. No one from the university would do an interview today, but it says that the Students' Union putting this information out early is irresponsible. It says these are merely ideas the university is considering and a final decision won't happen until the Board of Regents meets in May. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Fire tore through a hardware store in Happy Valley Goose Bay early this morning and police are calling it suspicious. The blaze destroyed the business along with a neighboring warehouse. The owner says he is devastated. Here now's Jacob Barker has more. The owner of what used to be Motherwood Timber Mart and this uh, neighboring warehouse says he is shocked to learn that RCMP are looking at the possibility that the fire here was deliberately set. The fire crews are continuing their work as they have throughout the day to put out the hot spots that have continued to burn here. RCMP say they'll be able to get on site to do a thorough investigation once that work is done. Fire crews got word at about 2.45 this morning. 15 volunteer firefighters arrived to find the back half of the building fully engulfed in flames. The fire spread to the neighboring warehouse, part of the same property. Both were destroyed. We're being a hardware store, all, all the, the wood material, paint, supplies, everything that's in there is, you know, toxic or whatever. And it just wasn't worthwhile to uh, send the firefighters in with the way the fire was burning inside. Morris Hill, the owner of the store, says he's owned the business for the past two years, but he recently put it up for sale for a price tag of just under $4.5 million. He says it's a devastating day for him and his family. He says he was shocked at what he saw when he arrived at about 4 a.m. When we were driving up the road, we quickly realized the severity of it. And when we got on site, it's total devastation for us and our family, of course. In addition to losing the building, Hill estimates the contents were worth about $3 million. About 15 people worked at the shop and will be affected by this. Hill says he's in contact with insurance adjusters. 
how things go with insurance, whether we're, we're talking about rebuilding or we're just going to leave it. But I mean, it definitely was my intent to stay in the business for several years. So we'll see what happens in the future. Meanwhile, the RCMP investigation continues. They're asking anybody in the public with information about the fire to come forward. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Police are looking to speak with anyone who may have witnessed a deadly highway crash near Holyrood. A young woman died last night after the SUV she was driving rolled over an embankment. It happened around 8.30 on a section of the Trans-Canada Highway just west of the Holyrood Access Road. The 25-year-old woman was the only person in the vehicle and police say she was from Paradise. There's an investigation underway tonight into why a heavy tube fell three meters on the Hibernia offshore platform, nearly killing someone. The board that oversees the offshore describes the incident this way. Four people were on the drill floor of the rig when a section of what's called completion tubing fell last Friday. The tube weighed 515 kilograms or nearly 1,200 pounds. No one was injured, but the board says the accident had the potential to be fatal. There's a search tonight for a man missing from Botwood. Terry Porter hasn't been seen since yesterday. He's 78 years old. Police say he was last seen around 7.15 last night driving a white Chevrolet Lumina in the Grand Falls and Botwood areas. Porter is 5'9", thin with gray hair, and he uses crutches to help him walk. Well, Team Guzhu really took this province on a thrilling ride this year. Now it's our turn to say thank you. The team is being honored tonight at the Bally Haley Curling Club in St. John's. And here now Zach Audi is there and joins us now live. So Zach, you talked with the members of Team Guzhu today. Have their feet even touched the ground since the, the competition? Well, just barely, Carolyn. They have not yet had the chance to truly savor all of this celebrating because they just uh, keep on curling. In fact, after their Briar win here in St. John's and again after the World Championships in Edmonton, they had additional tournaments in which they competed. In fact, the team still has one last tournament to go before they can close the books on this historic season. And yes, they are looking forward to that. Now today, I had the pleasure of interviewing the whole team. They said everywhere they go now, people are coming up to congratulate them, to tell them how much they've enjoyed watching them this season. And not just Brad Gushu and Mark Nichols, but also Brett Gallant and Jeff Walker. They too now must get used to being celebrities and sports heroes in this province. Now for Brad Gushu and Mark Nichols, who have spent the better part of their lives chasing this dream, I asked them how it feels to finally be on top of the mountain. Well, Brad Gushu says it has not dulled his desire to keep on winning. In fact, he revealed what's next for Team Gushu. Yeah, I've, I've re I reevaluate my goals every year. Um, and for me, I want to get back to the Olympics now. So that's, uh, it's out there. Everybody knows. <laughs> so that's the goal. Obviously, next year uh, we're in the Olympic trials, so so winning that would be would be nice. But even after that, I'm I'm certain I'll go another cycle and and give it another crack. And and that's kind of the the next goal on on my agenda. Um, I haven't really shared it with this guy <laughs> until this. So so uh, yeah. So so we'll we'll have a discussion this week. But I, I'm I'm certain that's where these guys are as well. You heard it here first. First, folks, from the Briar to the World Championships and maybe right back to the Olympics. Stick around. There's much more of that interview still to come on here and now. And everyone's favorite curling correspondent, Devin Haru, will join me later in the show. Reporting live from Bally Haley, I'm Zach Gowdy. The massive Hebron oil platform is scheduled to be towed out sometime next month, but nailing down the actual date or something close to it proved to be difficult yesterday during ceremonies marking the end of construction of the $14 billion structure. As Here Now Sees Hair reports, with the weather and now the ice off our shores, Mother Nature will ultimately have the final say. A clear weather window of opportunity is necessary for the tow out of the Hebron platform, but this white stuff behind me, ice, no doubt will be a factor in the equation. The 750,000 ton rig floats in Bull Arm, waiting for the big day. Powerful tugboats will tow it from Trinity Bay to the Jean d'Arc Basin and place it on the ocean floor. 
only 32 kilometers from Hibernia. During Tuesday's tour and christening, lots of numbers were tossed around. The rig's weight, the price tag, the amount of oil it can store. But one number was missing, the actual date of the tow out. Only a month was given, May. There's a lot of ocean to cover in a platform tow out. For Hibernia, the voyage was 500 kilometers. Good weather, storm free is necessary. And then there's something other than the weather, ice. And we've got lots of it this year and icebergs too. Now they come and go with the wind. This image from the Canadian Coast Guard yesterday shows heavy ice in Conception Bay. Today, the ice has moved into the Narrows in St. John's. Then there are the bergs. Today's charts online show roughly 250 icebergs in a corridor between the east side of the Avalon and where the Hebron rig is going. Keep in mind too that bergs move, they vary in size, and not all of them are as big as the one off Ferryland last weekend. So when will it happen? The real answer, no matter how impressive this $14 billion engineering feat is, in the end, Mother Nature still calls the shots, and no one knows when she'll say, you're free to go. Seasair, CBC News, St. John's. And speaking of the offshore, where you find pack ice, you may also find seals. And as is the tradition, this is the time of year when some of them end up on the St. John's Harbor front. Sales are going really good. We started uh, Good Friday and uh, we've been selling out every day. Seal flippers may not be for everyone, but for those who enjoy a good feed, this is a real yeah, treat. For 25 years, Heidi Taylor has been selling flippers on Harbor Drive. It's a family tradition started by her grandfather and carried down through the generations. The CBC's Bruce Tilly spoke with some longtime customers about how they like to prepare this culinary delicacy. I put the flippers in soak overnight and put some baking soda on them, take them off in the morning, clean them, and put them in and let them boil for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and then put the vegetables in. I'm gonna cook them tomorrow. I got some friends coming in. I'm gonna cook up a dozen of them for sure. Cook them in the oven with a nice big side over the top. And we're gonna have a great feed. A few drinks, good party. I grew up in an outport where seal, Meat, you know, was fairly common in the spring. Since, uh, you know, becoming an adult, what have you, and living here in St. John's every year, I usually get a half dozen flippers, and my wife cooks them very, very well. Two at a time, you know, one in the fall, and then two more in the spring, and so on. Yep. You think you have potholes? After the break, travel the road that some people say is destroying their vehicles and their bodies. And later we'll take you to Corner Brook for a look at children who are getting tips this week from some of the best ballet dancers.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. about you, but out came the winter coat and mm -hmm. hat and everything today. Wow. And lots of cold. wind. I walked out of the front door and just gust blew <laughs> dust into my face. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not a nice wind. It's a no. northerly wind, which is raw, as you were alluding to there. Uh, winter coats, definitely, and that northerly wind not going anywhere. And the winds have been causing some issues, jamming harbors all over the province with ice. This Wow. seen earlier today near Twillingate, according to Julie Gidge, whose stepfather is on one of those crab boats. They've been trying to get out since 11 a.m. this morning to leave to go and fish crab, but uh, not going anywhere right now. Yeah, they look pretty stuck. Definitely. Yeah, nothing you can do unless the weatherman forecasts a different uh, direction of wind. It's funny you should mention <laughs> that. Uh, where I'm going to show you the model projection in terms of winds. Uh, first, let's look at where the winds are right now. Current sustained winds in from the north northeast. There's Twillingate. There is St. John's, and again, the winds sustained right now in that 30 to 40 kilometer per hour range. Now, in terms of the winds and what they're going to do over the next few days, northerly tonight through Thursday and into Friday and into Saturday as well. There's the setup by Friday. Uh, as we take a look into the Saturday time period, this is the long range. This is the Euro model projection, and you can see where the northerly winds stick around into Saturday and then possibly some relief into Sunday with a bit of a shift back to southwest and then even westerly as we roll into the Monday time period. This will also, of course, help our temperatures, and we'll be talking more about that with the long-range forecast coming up a little bit later in the show. In terms of the northerly winds today, you can see where, yeah, keeping temperatures in that uh, zero to two degree range for most of the northeast half of the island, a little bit warmer away from those onshore winds along the south and west coast. Got to 7 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a Labrador City near plus 3 today. And as we uh, back things out in terms of your satellite and radar picture, there's the area of high pressure, which has been bringing us some sunshine today, uh, helping to warm things up out of those onshore winds. This is still a weather player well off to the southeast. This is actually a tropical depression, uh, which is well to our southeast. Won't have any uh, direct impact on the island and this province, but it is helping to kind of block things up over uh, the Atlantic right now. And this trough line that you see here uh, is going to be pushed back towards our neck of the woods as we roll through the Thursday time period, increasing the cloud cover. We're going to be seeing a little band of snow develop into the afternoon. Could see a couple of centimeters of accumulation, especially inland and over higher elevation areas. Note the flurries that are rolling into Labrador at the same time, and this area of high pressure will basically get squeezed out. Uh, some sun breaks, though, before it does as we roll through the Thursday time period. Then the snow will become freezing rain for the Avalon and St. John's up the northeast coast, and that freezing rain will likely linger through most of Thursday night into the Friday time period. Uh, by the time we get to Friday morning, likely some snow for central, freezing rain mixed with rain along that northeast coast, and this is going to be a tricky setup. Uh, a couple of tenths of a degree here will make a big difference between whether this is mainly freezing rain or mainly rain likely dependent on elevation and we are looking at I think 10 to 15 millimeters of rainfall whether that falls as some of that is freezing rain or most of that uh, is still again a little uh, in terms of uh, uh, especially the Avalon in the northeast coast is still in question. Special weather statements are in effect for St. John's, the Avalon, Clarenville, Bonavista and Terra Nova with that potential for some significant freezing rain for Thursday night in through Friday in particular. So we still have a bit of time to nail this down. Here's your forecast by the, t the time we get to tomorrow morning. Minus two, just mainly cloudy in St. John's. A little bit uh, brighter start to the day towards the west coast and central. And again, a bit of light snow pushing into Labrador City. As we roll throughout the day, the clouds thicken up with those uh, afternoon flurries and then some light snow and then the freezing rain potential develops for Thursday night, uh, Thursday evening into the overnight. Building clouds through central tomorrow, temperatures as warm as 2 to as warm as 6 degrees along the south coast and west coast tomorrow across the island. And as we roll into Labrador, you can see where we're looking at some snow uh, building in to the west. Not a bad day with some sunshine in the southeast. Long range details are still ahead, Carolyn.
Thanks, Ryan. Well, it's certainly not a smooth ride driving along the Trans Labrador Highway on the south coast of Labrador this time of year. As you can see, muddy conditions make it difficult to navigate and for some vehicles near impossible. And while work is slated for later this year, local people would like to see pavement down sooner rather than later. Here now's Jacob Barker tried his luck on this bumpy road. It's a mucky, muddy mess this time of year. The south coast's leg of the Trans-Labrador Highway. Oh man, it's brutal. Brutal on me and brutal on trucks. This trucker brings groceries from Happy Valley Goose Bay to Cartwright every week. Poor conditions add hours to the already long commute. Taking the toll on the groceries in the back, beating everything up pieces. His message is clear. Please fix the road. Brutal. On softer sections of the highway like this one, the vehicles that pass make ruts in the highway that make it difficult for those that are coming behind them to navigate. The consistency of what they're driving on is essentially mud. Steve Sturge delivers firewood. The road in his area after the Charlottetown Junction has been improved, but he says it still gets bad this time of year and grading could have begun much earlier this season. One trip, not so bad, but if you make two or three, you're beat up at the end of the day. Our store here for the last two weeks has had more empty shelves than full shelves because we're waiting on ferries and, and, and roads. In Cartwright, the mayor who also runs this convenience shop says the section of highway that runs past his community hasn't been upgraded since it was completed in 2002. It's not satisfactory to have gravel road open 15 years and then lose all the other services that you depended on before the roads that, that were working. And at the school, uncertainty around road conditions make logistics for an upcoming school drama festival difficult. It's hard to get parents to drive over the road too with their kids and, and teachers to volunteer to take the kids places when they got to put their vehicle on, on something like that. One teacher recently busted his vehicle en route to a heritage fair. The cost, $2,300. We were almost nine hours just from here to Goose Bay because it was axle deep mud the whole time. The provincial government does have a plan to eventually upgrade the section of highway near Cartwright. It's applying to cost share that with the federal government. For people in this area, it'll be a bumpy road until that happens. Jacob Barker, CBC News on the Trans-Labrador Highway. It's getting crowded here at Bally Haley as folks wait for their chance to pay tribute to Team Gushu and to get a picture with the Briar Tanker. More of my interview with the whole team coming right up after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. And let's go back to the Ballyhaley Curling Club where Team Guju is being celebrated tonight. Historic wins at the Briar and the World Championships have put the team on top of the curling world. So where did they go from here? Uh, for that, we go live to Here and Now, Zach Gowdy, who's right in the thick of all the celebration there at Ballyhaley. So Zach, you talked with members of Team Guju today. What's next for them after the success of this season? Well, Debbie, they told me that winning it all has only increased their desire to win again. In fact, earlier in the show, we heard Brad Gushu say he already has his eyes on another Olympic run. But either way, this is a moment for the whole team to savor. For Brett Gallant and Jeff Walker, it's the start of a new life as sports heroes and celebrities in this province. And for Gushu and Mark Nichols, who already know what that feels like, it's the culmination of a lifelong dream. Now, earlier today, Brad Gushu began our conversation by comparing the Briar and World Championship wins with that Olympic gold medal that they won back in 2006. I think when we came home from the Olympics, obviously our, our lives had changed. Um, that was, that's the pinnacle of sports. This time around, it's, it's a little bit different because we actually didn't come home after winning the Worlds. So we went to another event. So things have kind of, kind of settled down, I guess, in that week. Uh, but still, we've been really busy with interviews and, and functions. We had a, an event at the St. John's Curling Club on Monday and at Ballyhaley tonight. Um, so we've been busy and, and even around, around town, even if I'm going to get gas or popping into a convenience store, people are, are thanking us and, and congratulating us. And there's a lot of people around here that know what we did and are aware of it, which is very similar to what it was in 2006. What does that feel like, uh, Brett, when you see this, the looks on people's faces every time you're getting gas and somebody else wants to come and congratulate you? Oh yeah, it's different for sure. You know, um, myself not being from here, not being part of the Olympic run, um, you know, I, I could walk around town pretty easily, but now after this, uh, you're, you know, people are always coming up congratulating us and, and you know, just saying how proud they were to, to witness it and stuff like that. So it, it's really cool to be part of that now. Uh, Mark, maybe it would be hard, I guess, for you guys to overstate this, but I'll ask you to, to state it for me anyway. How much of your life has been built around doing the very thing that you just did? <laughs> Pretty much all of it. <laughs> it's been crazy. You know, you growing up as a curler, the Briar itself was, you know, that's what you wanted to win and wanted you wanted to play in the Briar. And then once you once we realized, you know, we got a chance to to win this thing. That's kind of what you strive for. And like I said, we, we've been oh, oh so close a few times, and it just seems like, uh, you know, the, the storybook wrote itself this time. You know, losing 12 months ago. And really, just kind of putting all our focus on that one event is uh, the the way it happened. Uh, we couldn't write it any better. What do you want the legacy of, of this year to be? Of all that that this team has achieved this year, if you if you look down the road, I mean, what what kind of lasting legacy again? Maybe even off the ice sheets, do you guys want to leave behind? Hmm. On the ice sheets, I, I certainly hope it gets more young people involved with the sport. But uh, I don't think it has to be just curling. I think it can inspire. Uh, kids to get into all different sports um, and just to get the community to come together the way it did for the Briar as well. Like that was a that was so special the way it um, seemed like all of Newfoundland embraced our our one team for uh, you know the Briar week and then on to the Worlds and and even throughout our season so just the way everybody came together and if it can get more kids interested in sport inspire them I think that's uh, that's a great thing. And uh, to, on top of that I, I'd like to see you know, kids and, and even adults across the, the province realize that, you know, just because we're from a small province doesn't, it mean, doesn't mean you can't be the best in the world. And uh, I know growing up in sports, when I played baseball and hockey, there was always this um, understanding or, or belief that we weren't going to get to the top because we're from a small little place in the North Atlantic. Uh, but it, it can happen, and not just us, but you see what happened with Caitlin Caitlin Osmond and, and Katrina Roxon and, and uh, you know, a lot of great athletes and teams in this province and what we've done. And I seen a tweet actually a couple of days ago that we have the, the national championships in golf, curling, uh, figure skating. Like it's incredible what we have here. And, and I think seeing all that success is gonna help the, the youth going forward to b believe that they can do it. And, and once you have that belief, then you're gonna put in the work and, and you can actually make it happen.
But here at Valley Haley, the crowds keep pouring in, the bubbly is pouring up, and it should be a very memorable night. Now, perhaps the only person who enjoyed the success of Team Gushu as much as the members of Team Gushu is Devin Haru, the CBC Sports Correspondent, covered the team every step of the way through the Briar win, through the World Championships in Edmonton. Now, Devin Haru is here tonight as an honorary guest. He'll be my guest coming up on Here and Now. Reporting live from Valley Haley, I'm Zach Gow. After the break, we'll hear more about the ruckus at Memorial University between administrators and the student union, and it has to do with the talk of a big tuition hike. Welcome back, and now back to our top story. The student union at Memorial University is on the attack after a budget committee meeting revealed that the university is considering a 16% tuition hike and possible fee increases. Now, no decisions have been made, but the union decided to go public with the information, a move that is not going over very well with the administration. This afternoon, we heard from Renata Lang from Munsu and the province's education minister, Jerry Byrne, Here's more of what they had to say. Yeah, so we've seen three major things on the table uh, proposed by the university's administration, which is a 16% increase on tuition for all students, and we're also seeing two new fee increases in the form of ancillary fees. One for the student life department and another for ancillaries of the university, such as maintaining buildings and infrastructure. What sort of concerns do you have with uh, what the university is proposing? Yeah, so our main concern is that they are proposing that the 16% tuition increase is going to target students who are not from Newfoundland and Labrador. So we're asking, what does that look like? Um, of course, because students who are currently here are residing in Newfoundland and Labrador. Many are from here and have moved away or returned. So we think it's going to be pretty hard for them to determine exactly who is going to take the hit of those cuts. And then, of course, it's the brand new fees that are going to be in place. One of them is per credit hours that you take. So students Students who are required to be full-time, such as international students, to be in the country will arguably already be having to pay more of an ancillary fee. 
Yeah, as you know, the province is facing a really dire fiscal state right now. We have the highest youth unemployment rate in the country, a huge gender wage gap, and students or young people are overwhelmingly um, have been leaving the province. So to reta retain students here, we need to maintain a freeze for everyone, especially to diversify the economy and to bring in new skill and talent to Newfoundland and Labrador. Those set fees will bring in more students. But even with the increases, the tuition fees here would still be the cheapest in the country unless you're from Quebec. So wouldn't that mean that Memorial is still very competitive? Memorial is, of course, the leader, like you said, on the most affordable fees in the country. And we want to keep it that way because we want fees to be maintained frozen, to continue to have students stay here who are from Newfoundland, to continue to attract those who are from out of province, where it is skyrocketing everywhere else across the country. We're dealing with a hypothetical question right now because, of course, Memorial University and its Board of Regents have not met. These, uh, the information supplied by the Memorial University of Newfoundland Student Union is information that even I have not seen. So uh, what I do understand is that the Board of Regents will be meeting sometime in May with, uh, to make final decisions on their future administrative plans as well as their overall budgets. So at this point in time I can't really comment on whether or not there's a, a, a fee increase or for that matter a tuition increase in, in Site Vermont. But what I, I can say is this, is that there are two revenue items from students at MUN. One is a tuition, uh, a, a tuition rate. The other, and this has been the case for years, there have been fees that have been charged. Athletic fees, uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland Student Union fees, for example. The student union itself has been collecting fees from the students for a number of years. And an interesting component of that is that those fees at the request of the student union have been increasing for the last number of years. So tuition and fees are not one and the same. The bottom line here is we have to start with a, you know, with a question, which is, is the university being starved of resources? Well, and you know, pr some would say that because the tuition is so low, which it is, that the university is being starved for resources. I have to come back to the clear point, which is, at $371 million in taxpayer-provided assistance, it is difficult to make the argument that the university is being starved of resources. Again, we provide more money to MUN than the government of the people of Nova Scotia provide to 10 of its universities with three times the student population. So uh, I think we should get that off the table, that the university is starved of resources and has no other option except to increase fees, because I think there may be an alternative, which is lower expenses. MUN officials are not answering questions about this today. Instead, they released a statement. Yes, and in it, uh, MUN Acting President Noreen Golfman called the comments from Munsu inflammatory, and she writes that the ideas put forward were not proposals. She says all budget options are up for discussion. Golfman also says all the information will be shared and discussed at the Senate meeting on April 24th. <laughs> We're all interested in the long-range forecast, but I couldn't help but notice what Ryan is wearing tonight. He's got his blue suit on, blue <laughs> polka <laughs> dots. I guess blue. there must be a Leafs game tonight. Mm -hmm. That's right. Until they're out, I'm wearing this. Uh, I'm going to go with blue, nothing but blue, uh, all the way through. So. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about tonight's game, i got to say, but uh, they've We've, uh, you disappointed you before. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> One or two times in the past. For about the last decade, yeah. Uh, in terms of the forecast, uh, again, some disappointment over the next few days. But, you know, last night uh, we were talking about that warm up in the long range, and it's still there, but we have to get there first. Mm, right. uh, have a look. Again, it's a quiet Thursday. Still that relentless northerly wind across the Avalon in the east. Wintry mix arrives for Thursday afternoon, especially Thursday night into Friday. And again, it's some baby steps in the long range. Having said all this, uh, not a bad looking long range for the West and even into Labrador. Again, uh, with the northerly flow, it's typically central and east that take the brunt of the, uh, the bad weather. And that's certainly what the setup has been and will continue to be over the next couple of days. There's the low well to our south. That's actually a tropical depression now, throwing some moisture up into our neck of the woods. And again, this trough line is gonna back its way in 
slowly but surely tomorrow. Cloud cover dominates across the east. Would be surprised if we see some sun breaks early on in the day. Clouds thick into the afternoon. Bit of snow for the drive home. Enough to uh, slick the roads up, perhaps a little bit of accumulation for inland and higher elevation areas. Temperatures in the 1 to 2 degree range. Uh, increase in clouds for central and the west, where we'll be as warm as 6 degrees. And in Labrador, it's just a bit of uh, clouds and flurry action rolling in from the west. And the forecast model picking that up quite nicely. Picking things up here. Thursday afternoon. There's that little bit of snow and then over to that freezing rain potential. Now, despite this forecast model showing a change over to just rain, temperatures are going to be riding right around the freezing mark and the potential for freezing rain continues Thursday night and into Friday morning for the Avalon, the Northeast and uh, up that uh, in the central parts of Newfoundland. It will indeed likely be just some snowfall there that clears out through Friday and that rain and freezing rain potential continues into Friday across the Avalon and the Northeast Coast. This is where Environment Canada has issued special weather statements. Again, a degree difference will make a big difference in terms of how much ice accretion and buildup we see. And I think like many setups we've seen in the past, this will be dependent on elevation where inland and higher eleva elevation areas like the airport uh, will be more prone to seeing icing, whereas right along parts of the lower elevation and the coastlines uh, likely changes over to rain a little bit earlier especially as we work into the day on Friday. But the potential here for 10 to 15 millimeters of rain and some of that, uh, if not a lot of that, could be some freezing rain and icing building up there. So we're going to want to keep an eye on that to, as we move through the Thursday night into Friday forecast. Freezing rain and rain in my forecast. Again, some light snow in central will clear. Sun and cloud for the west and scattered flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador. And there's your forecast for Saturday again. Sun and cloud for Labrador. We're looking at isolated shower chances for the west and uh, clouds with showers. And yes, over to RDF in the east, which is an improvement from the icing. And then as we roll into Sunday, note the wind shift here. Uh, five, six degrees as temperatures start to rise. And yes, that's some good news as we roll into that seven day trend, which does show some relief and a little more in the way of some sunshine uh, for Monday, Tuesday into Wednesday, which is some good news there. We'll Keep our fingers crossed that that holds and into Labrador again. Not a bad looking weekend on the way there. Well, this little dancer is six year old Bridget Little from St. John's. Bridget loves learning new routines and performing with Revolutions Dance in Mount Pearl. Oh, she also enjoys soccer, skating, swimming, reading, and going to school. Way to go, Bridget. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. A professional ballet troupe is taking its show across the province. After the break, we'll meet some of the young children who are getting to experience the dance up close. Well, look who's back, Devin Haru. Good to see you on the rock again. It's great to be here. It's always a good day for curling. Take a look at that beautiful trophy in the house here tonight, Zach. In the house. Devin Haru in the house with me right after the break.
Well, now let's get back to the big bash being thrown for Team Guju tonight. Possibly the only person who has enjoyed their curling success more than the members of Team Guju is Devin Haru. The CBC Sports correspondent won legions of fans in this province with his coverage of the Briar and the Curling World Championships. Now Haru is back as a guest at tonight's celebration of Team Guju at Valley Haley. And here now Zach Audi joins us once again live from Valley Haley. And look, Yes, Devin with him. Zach. That's right. The uh, honorary Newfoundlander and Labradorian is the guest of honor at tonight's banquet. Uh, Devin, thanks again for joining us. You spent a big part of this year talking about the briar, and here you get to be up close and personal with the trophy. Here it is, uh, this briar tankard, obviously the trophy everybody plays for every single year. And of course, Zach, we know there was so much pressure on this Gushu team to win this trophy. Of course, I'm going to touch it right now. But Are you sure you should, you should do that? I have no aspirations of ever winning this thing. But of course, if, if, if you are a player, you don't want to touch it until you win it. That is the curling curse. But let's get in tight here. I think we can get this shot, Zach. And take a look here at that 1976 Jack McDuff win, of course, prior to this year. Newfoundland and Labrador had never won the Briar, and if we go a couple of layers down, right there is where that Gushu heart is going to go. And what a moment that was for this entire province, Zach. It's great to be here again. It's so great to have you. It was so great to have you during the coverage. You know, you talked a lot about uh, the pressure that the Gushu team were under, but did you start to feel some of that pressure yourself as suddenly you were the guy at the center of the coverage, What at the center of what you must have sensed was suddenly the biggest story in this part of the world? It was the biggest story, and it should have been the biggest story. And I've got to tell you, of course, we bring a level of objectivity Objectivity to the table when we do this, but I uh, but let me tell you Zach when we're there And I'm watching that final shot and I had the best seat in the house because I was right behind the sheet and you see Mark Nichols run out of the hack and They're all going on that rock and the crowd and everybody's whipped into hysterics and I'm thinking I'm not prepared to write a story with a Gushu rink losing tonight. And it was so intense, so you talk about that pressure. I wanted to capture the moment because, and I've, I've written about this and reported and talked about this, this is so much more than a curling game. I had an elderly woman, a fan of Team Gushu, tell me if they were playing tiddly winks in the mile one center, they'd still pack the place. I believe it. So it's been a remarkable journey for this team. And then, of course, on to Edmonton, where they're on top of the curling world. Well, Devin, I know your coverage won a lot of people's hearts here. Hence, again, you were invited back. I know you got a chance to see the big iceberg in Fairland. Not all work when we bring you back to Newfoundland and Labrador. But thanks so much for joining us. And uh, have a bit of fun tonight yourself. Thank you, Zach. It's great to be here. Again, we'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Thanks so much. That's our Zach Gowdy with Devin Haru, who is going to be uh, speaking at all the festivities there shortly at Valley Haley. Now to this story, a professional ballet company is in the province, bringing its production of Swan Lake to local arts and culture centers. But when the dancers who are in Canada's ballet, Georgian, are not performing on the stage, they're teaching children about the art. Here now's Colleen Connors went to the Cornerbrook Public Library, where students were trading books for tutus. <laughs> Today we're here at the Cornerbrook Public Library. We're here performing in uh, Ballet 101. So our Ballet 101 is a program that we take to libraries and smaller um, situations, smaller settings, um, to be able to introduce a large range of people to dance and to what we do every day um, to get people passionate about um, learning about dance and hopefully um, viewing it and possibly doing it themselves. Me that again. How does it work? The alleged Oh, how graceful! That's beautiful. And tell me about what's in your hair today. Um, a tiara. And how come you're wearing a tiara? Because I got a ballerina bun. Oh, 
ballerina bun. Is that what that is? Yeah. Oh, it's very pretty. What did you think of the ballerinas today? They're beautiful. Did you watch them dance? Yep. Yeah? Yeah. It's a lot about um, getting them involved. So we have a lot of children here today who are up dancing with us. We're able to show them a little bit of um, what we do in the studio, um, as well as what we do on stage. So we get them to take a look at our costumes and our point shoes, and um, we get them to join us in learning a little bit of choreography or um, showing a little bit of uh, different characters and that, that sort of thing. So it's a very um, hands-on, very um, collaborative process. It's part of our mandate to actually bring dance to as many people as possible. Um, I think part of it is actually bringing dance to elementary schools so um, children will see dance at least twice before they graduate. So it's a, it's a big thing to be able to um, get children, again, um, passionate about this, this kind of art. A Nova Scotia man says he's not giving up his fight for a full refund on his all-inclusive sunwing vacation in Cuba. He says he stayed at a resort for nearly a week with his girlfriend and his daughter without running water. There was people in the pool shaving, shampooing, soaping, just trying to get cleaned up via the pool water. Wow, Ben Nanton says toilets couldn't be flushed and food remnants weren't washed from plates and cutlery. He wants the $2,700 he paid refunded. So far, Sunwing has only offered $385 to cover the cost of his room. Authorities say former NFLer Aaron Hernandez was found dead in his cell early this morning. Prison, prison officials in Massachusetts says Hernandez took his own life. Hernandez was serving a life sentence for the murder of a man who was dating his fiance's sister. The former New England Patriots star was acquitted just last week in a double murder case. Police say a deadly triple shooting in Central California was racially motivated. A man randomly shot and killed three white men in Fresno yesterday. 39-year-old Corey Ali Muhammad was arrested, and he reportedly told police he wanted to kill as many white people as he could before he was captured. Muhammad is in custody facing murder charges. He's also charged in the shooting death of another man last week. Get your telescopes ready. A peanut-shaped object will whiz by the Earth tonight. The large asteroid will pass Earth from about 1.8 million kilometers away. That might seem far, but it's the closest it's been to us in 400 years. Yes, NASA says the asteroid will be visible by small optical telescopes for one or two nights. So get ready because it won't fly by again for about 500 years.
Texas suburb had an unexpected guest. Yes, it's a 10 foot long alligator and it stopped. Uh, it's just there. There it is. You can see it opening. It's not. Oh. oh, yep. Can't miss it there. <laughs> yes, uh, it stopped to hang out on someone's front porch. Oh wow. The, the, ga ga the gator came uh, by after a night of rainfall. Residents called animal control to collect the 200 pound critter, but uh, it didn't go down without a fight. Oh. Eventually, the game wardens did round it up. Yep, no problems with that. And uh, then residents could finally say, oh. <laughs> see you later, alligator. <laughs> What's the other part of that in a wild crocodile? Uh. After a wild crocodile. <laughs> wow, that would be a surprise walking out your front step. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, alligators there. We got to deal with polar bears here, of course. Oh. So. Uh, uh, different worlds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have a look uh, in terms of where temperatures are right now uh, for the forecast tomorrow. That is uh, just two on the plus side. Again, some building clouds, a bit of some afternoon snow building into St. John's. It's tomorrow night and in through the Friday time period. We'll have to deal with some uh, snow, ice and freezing rain. We'll uh, again remind you of that special weather statement in effect. Oh, I misunderstood you. I thought we were going to see a polar bear. No, 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 I don't have any polar bear. Pictures. But they're <laughs> out Sorry there. There have been lots of them spotted. Thanks for being with us, everyone. See you later, alligator. Good night, everyone. <laughs>